Okay, everyone. Uh, I'm Peter Hood. I am the chairman. Whoa, something just happened. That's I thought they'd want to see you. No, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, good evening. I'm Peter Hood. I'm the chairman of the select board, and I will be the uh, the moderator of this meeting because this is actually a select board meeting, even though it is an informational meeting uh, for our town for our town meeting, as you all know. Um, this is an informational meeting. There will be, of course, no voting. So it's information only, and it is definitely not, <coughs> excuse me, a candidate's forum. So it's to discuss, it's to discuss the articles on the Australian ballot for town meeting, not to discuss um, the people who are running for office. Um, at this time, I'd like the uh, uh, select board members to introduce themselves. You've heard from me. Steve, how about you? Yeah, hi, Steve Martin. I've been on the select board for several years. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's it. Okay, Bill? Uh, Phil Hayek, I'm, I'm Steve's neighbor. <laughs> On the, the board about three and a half years, I guess. Mary? Mary Jess Skinner, um, on the board for quite a long time, been in uh, Middlesex since 1976. And Liz? Hi, Liz Scharf. Um, this will be my seventh year on the board. I'm not up for re-election till next year. And I live on Culver Hill Road and I've lived here for 20 years. Thank you, everyone. Um, so for the participants in the meeting, uh, please identify yourself when you speak. And in a minute, I'm gonna introduce Delia, who is gonna tell you how to say, change the name, <coughs> excuse me, on your screen, if it isn't your real name, because otherwise we won't know who you are. Um, but it's a good idea to identify, I'm sorry, <coughs> a tickle in my throat. No, oh, thank you. Um, I heard Mary. <laughs> oh, I know she's here. She's 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 keeping an eye on me. Um, I guess is now is, this would be a good no. time to to introduce uh, Delia, who's going to be our Zoom uh, facilitator, mm -hmm. uh, to give us a little pep talk on how to use Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Right. Sure. Hi, everybody. And uh, <laughs> hi again, the people that I saw last time. Um, I live in Woodstock, Vermont, and I'm just helping out with Zoom tonight. It, so um, it is really good to know who you are. Um, you know who you are, but for everyone else. So if you hover your cursor just above your face, you'll see three little dots. And if you click on those dots, you'll get You're frozen. Yeah, so you can see that uh, you can stop video if you don't want it to be looking at you, but don't do that because we really want to be able to see everybody. Um, and uh, you that's where the mute button is also, which is also down on the bottom. It's good if you mute yourself when you're not speaking, and that way in case your dog barks or something like that, it'll be quieter for everybody else. And then there's one called rename. And if you hit the rename button, you can type in your first and last name uh, in case that you've got your your kids uh, laptop or your organizations or whatever. So put your actual name on there. Um, as I said, I encourage you to keep your camera on the whole time. Um, it just helps build sense of community unless you have bandwidth issues. Um, if you I, I suggest you find the chat button, which is down along the bottom. And if you click chat and keep it open during the meeting, that's how you're going to be identifying if you want to uh, ask a question. You'll be putting your name into chat. So that's a, if you have it open, you'll be able to see if anyone else is um, putting in questions. We're not going to have comments about what's um, being said in the chat, though. So don't, we don't want to have a lot of side conversations in this particular meeting. Um, if you uh, get into, and I'm going to share my screen now for a minute just to share some of these points. Um, if you, uh, let's see, use that gallery view and that maybe you can see more people if you want to. And um, 
the only other thing I wanted to talk about was if you want to ask a question about the article at hand, wait until Peter has introduced that article and then type your name into chat and make sure it's addressed to everyone. You don't want to send it just to one person. Um, if, it, if we have fewer, 20 or fewer people, um, then you can just raise your hand and Peter can see you. So this, this will, if we end up a little bit bigger group, then that means uh, he won't be able to see everybody and that allows you to get in the queue to ask a question. If you have a tech issue during the session, you can call Sarah Berger. She's at 802-689-0719. And she's standing there to help with any tech issues. And also if you can't access chat to get in line, um, she can help you do that. That is all I've got to say about Zoom and um, have a great meeting. Thank you, Delia. And again, thank you in advance for uh helping us with this meeting. We got a little, uh, we got a trial run a week ago, so hopefully we'll be a little more professional this time, but the meeting went pretty well a week ago. Um, so the only other thing I have in my introduction, Sarah, is the point about the missing ballots. Is that still an issue? Uh, yes. In fact, we've been able to narrow it down a little bit. It seems that most of the people who are experiencing missing town ballots live along Center Road, a certain section of Center Road. We don't understand why just this, the machine failed those people, on, uh, but there you go. Okay, so the issue is, yes. Sarah. I have a, I have a related question. Go ahead, Peter. We have three Sarahs here, so you can just call me. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Sarah Seidman. You had a question? I, I, I well, am I on mute? No, we can um, hear you. I just wanted to ask about the, the births and deaths and marriages that didn't get into the town report. What, are, what is the town gonna do to, because the Historical Society, obviously we all use that on a, <clears throat> well, Sarah, record the history. We have, that was, that was, a printing error and with the, we found it out the day that it disappeared and when we put it on our website right away. So you can just get page 110, 109 or whatever it is, but I'll be glad to send it to you again. Well, I, I'm more worried that it gets recorded as part of the official town history. So I don't know whether next year well, <laughs> we put in two, two years worth or. Well, we, we were thinking of putting in two years. Also, I uh, bind all the town reports and I will, uh, tack that on to the town report as it's bound and put in a vault. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, so with that, I think we're ready to start. Uh, we, have, we have warned the uh, budget discussion uh, for uh, 6.15 and it's not quite 6.15. So what I would like to do is talk about Article 5, which is the uh, shall a town of Middlesex voters authorize the select board to purchase a new grader in an amount not to exceed 290,000 to be financed over a period of 15 years. Um, select board members to present followed by questions. Select board members to present. Steve, you're muted, Steve. There, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, so yes, our, our grader is uh, 23 years old and uh, approximately 10 years ago, some uh, maintenance was done to the select board and decided to listen to it. So we've gone another 10 years, but uh, uh, the grader is getting tired. It needs major work. Uh, it's time for a new grader. So that's why we're asking for that amount of money not to exceed that uh, 290000 Um Right at this time, we have been offered uh, 35,000 for our grader from one of the vendors. Uh, that may change a little bit, but some of the vendors may change. Uh, they may ask a little more for their, uh, for the new grader and give you more for the old one. So it's just that game. Uh, but anyway, uh, 
I guess that's about all I have to say about that. Uh, on a, one other item is that uh, this grader, we would be uh, receiving this grader after July 1st of 21 with our first payment due after July 1st of 22. That's all I have on it. Any questions? So I just have uh, one comment to add to that. Um, our concern is that if we wait any longer, and we've already waited longer than we dared almost, um, and we have some kind of catastrophic breakdown to the existing grader, it will either A, be valueless, or at the very least B, be very expensive to repair and kind of be like throwing good money after bad. The other issue is, um, because the grader is worn out, the grading portion of the, of the grader, it doesn't grade the roads quite the way the road crew would like them to be graded. Um, so it causes them to work at a slower pace and it causes the results not to be as good. So the bottom line is we need a new grader and it's time and this is as good a time as any uh, for us to do it because we have no other major, uh, major purposes and by spreading it out over 15 years, the annual consequence to our budget will not be uh, will not be as great. Yes, Bill. Just a quick question, Steve, what's the expected life expectancy of the new grader? Um, well, it, normally the, the, a lot of the towns are doing 12, 15 years in that neighborhood. Normally, that's a kind of a normal time frame. Okay, thanks. We would hope a little longer though, right? Yes. <laughs> we always hope for that. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions? Okay then. It is hey, now. Oops, Randy. I'm sorry. Uh so I was just curious as to the the range of the difference in any bids that you may have received or through the discussions that you're having with any of the vendors. How big of a gap between high and low, or have you even gotten to that point? We haven't gotten to that point, Randy. I'll make that available as soon as we have that though. Thank you. There, uh, there are a lot of issues to be considered in purchasing this grader. You know, different options, different. So we're, we're just in the initiation phase of the process. So it is now uh, 615 and it's time to talk about the budget. Does everyone <laughs> now have their town report? I hope. Is there anybody who doesn't have it? <laughs> because I'm hoping last week, most people did not have, Steve was the only person in the whole group who had the town report. Uh, so we had, we asked Delia to put the budget up on, share her screen and put the budget up on the screen, but it was difficult to follow and hard to see. So um, I guess Delia, we're gonna be off the hook on the budget. That's the, that's the, that's the good news. And I would refer uh, everybody to, uh, to the budget, which is on page 40 to 44 and also uh, the select board budget report on page 23. And Phil is going to uh, give you the highlights of that budget report. Phil. Thanks, Peter. Um, as Peter said, everybody didn't have town reports um, last week when we did this. So I actually went over the entire uh, budget report, but this week, I think I'll take questions on it. You can find it again, as Peter said, on page 23. It also has been posted on uh, Front Porch Forum for those of you who access that. And what we try to do, or uh, what we've been doing the past few years, is to go over the highlights, breaking it down by the, the by the categories. You know, general government administration town hall um, and look at the the big items 
that uh, are impacting the budget. In, in a number of cases, um, you know, because we're a small town, we have uh, budget increases that will uh, look like 100 or 200 percent, but you know might actually represent uh, 50 or 100 dollars. So they're not not big ticket items. And you know, for the most part, we've tried to ignore those and look at the things that actually do uh, have some significant impact on the budget. So um, we could hang for a minute here, Peter, if you want to give people a chance to. Go to page 23, um, take a look, see if there's anything that you have for questions or if somebody already has a question that they wanna raise, we can deal with that now. And then I guess we'll move on to the, the budget itself. Well, also uh, Phil, you have the graph on page 39 where the money goes. I think that's Dorinda's. Oh, sorry. Yeah, she does that as treasurer. The other thing I would point out to everybody while you're perusing that is on page 37, there is a chart which shows the cost of all the articles for a house appraised at a certain value, which is useful information for discussion of all of these articles. Um, just to let people know that the actual budget itself begins on page 40. Phil's budget report begins on page 23, but the budget itself, every line and item begins on page 40. Unless right. I have a report. 40 to 44. Yeah. So questions on, uh, on Phil's report or any questions on the budget in general? Yes, Justin. You're muted. You're muted, Justin. Oh. Yeah, can you unmute him? Or Sarah. No, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah Berger has the power now. I do not have a question. I'm sorry about that. Oh, okay. Justin's caught talking about the Waterbury Senior Center. Right, he did right, right. I was, um, I was trying to get a cat to get off the desk at the time. I apologize. <laughs> no problem. P Peter, while I'm talking, I'm going to turn the controls over to Sarah Berger. And, and I, it sounds like you don't need me for the, the other things. So she's okay. your lady. She's on, char she's on deck. Okay. Thank you, Delia. Sure. See ya. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. I don't see any waving hands or nodding faces. Does that mean that there are no questions on the budget? We have a peaceful group tonight. Mm. Either many of the people that are on tonight were also on last uh, last Tuesday. So no, I know Mary. I'm just I just trying to give everybody a little time to to look things over. Okay, then. Well, if, if anybody thinks of anything as we go along here, yes, Bill. Bill, you're muted. Yeah, there you go. Uh, just a quick question on uh, the whole pandemic mess this year. Did it affect the budget up or down on any specific items? And how about going forward? So we were like just about every municipality in Vermont and across the country, uh, we were worried about what the effect of the pandemic would be on us. And in particular, our concern was that people wouldn't be able to pay their property taxes and that would adversely affect the town. Um, to date, that has not been the case. Is it still a concern as this goes on? Yes, it is, but uh, our delinquent taxes are pretty, uh, are pretty steady, it hasn't been an issue. Uh, we were also worried about uh, 
particularly the road crew, but all our town employees and uh, also operation of the town clerk's office during COVID times. But as much as that's changed the way the road crew works, and it certainly changed the way the folks in the town clerk's office work, I don't think it's had a horrible uh, effect on the service to community members. We've inconvenienced a few lawyers trying to do uh, trying to do title search work uh, because we can't have too many people in the office at one time. But in terms of in terms of dollars and cents, we spent a little money uh, reconfiguring, very little money because we had volunteers doing the work, uh, reconfiguring the town clerk's office. Um, but really minimal uh, minimal impact, I would say. Uh, Sarah, you have anything to add to that or Vic for the road department? Uh, well, speaking for the town clerk's office, it's, things seem to be pretty smoothly now, smooth now, and I don't think we've incurred any extra costs. Maybe Dorinda can speak to that. Um, like Peter said, uh, Dave uh, Crowell and Charlie put together the counter from reclaimed items. The only charge was the plexiglass uh, to put it up to put up the divider, and um, we've been taking a point. We were one of the first offices to create appointments so that lawyers could come in and research. So we've we've been pretty open. It just, it's an inconvenience for townspeople they, who want to come in and pay their taxes and have to knock on the door. Otherwise, that's about it. But it's a good question, Bill. Peter? Yes, Greg. Yeah, um, to answer that question, um, no, it hasn't. Uh, of course, I've only been there for a month, not even a month as road <laughs> commissioner. But I uh, by fast, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it uh, really, uh, I, I don't see that it's affected uh, the uh, road crew that much. I mean, they're pretty much in their vehicles by themselves if they're plowing or anything. And, uh, and uh, of course, we uh, adhere to the best of our ability, at, at least by distancing uh, when, uh, whenever we're around the, uh, the uh, garage. So... I don't know of anything that it's really, I can't think of anything that's really affected uh, or raised the cost of uh, doing business, so to speak. Well, I'm gonna knock on wood when I say this, but so far, uh, none of our staff have had a positive COVID test. Right. So that is truly the good news and hopefully that will continue. Yeah. Okay then. Well, if you uh, if you think of a question with regard to the budget, uh, we can we can go back to that at any time. This this meeting does not have the formality and structure of a regular uh, a regular town meeting, so don't think you can't ask a question at any time. So uh, let's see. We've done the budget. We've done the greater. Uh, we should go back to Article 2, should the Town of Middlesex authorize payment of all property taxes to the treasurer as provided by law without discount, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, basically allowing for uh, four payments of taxes, which seems to be, uh, or seems to have been, seems to be uh, very popular, as well as allowing U.S. Postal Service uh, postmarks to certify the due date. Does anybody have any questions about that article? Pretty straightforward. Um, article three, should the town of Middlesex charge interest at a rate of 0.5 per month or fraction thereof for overdue taxes? <laughs> uh, that's exactly what we've done uh, the last few years and we're proposing to continue that at the same rate. Any questions about that article? or concerns. Okay, so now we get to the uh, special articles and in your town report, uh, the again, the cost of those articles is on page 37. The special articles, uh, the discussion from the people requesting the money uh, is on page 
uh, 67 to 98 of your town report. Um, so we'll go through these one at a time. In some cases, uh, we have organizations here who will briefly uh, talk about their requests. Uh, in other cases, uh, we may have board members or other members of the community talking for the organizations. But uh, to start out with Article 6, so the Town of Middlesex appropriate the sum of $2,500 um, to the Middlesex Conservation Fund. The Middlesex Conservation Fund is a fund of money uh, administered by the Conservation Commission, which, uh, is there anybody here from the Conservation Commission? Or I talk about this? No, okay. Um, and this has been used, the, the money in that fund has been used for uh, different town projects over the years. The most notable one uh, being the acquisition of the town forest. Um, for many years, uh, the Conservation Commission with the support of the Select Board has requested $5,000 uh, to be added to the fund every year. Uh, this year, the Conservation Commission recommended and requested $2,500 in lieu of COVID trying to keep, uh, help keep expenses under control. So I think it is a worthy, uh, a worthy thing to keep that Conservation Commission fund going. Does anybody have any questions about that article? Um, article seven. Shall the town of Middlesex appropriate the sum of $600 to the Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation? So I'm gonna to speak to this one also. I am a, a member of the Central Vermont Economic Development Board, have been for a number of years. Mary Skinner uh, served many years on that, on that board uh, before me. Um, CVDC is an independent nonprofit uh, organization funded mostly by a state grant, but also by member dues and contributions from municipalities. They promote economic development in our region and in, co in concert with the other economic development corporations, economic development across the state. Um, while uh, we have not had many projects uh, in Middlesex where uh, the Economic Development Corporation was involved. Red Hen is probably the most notable recent one. Um, many of our town residents work for companies and organizations who have been supported by Central Vermont Economic Development. So um, they're requesting, we're requesting $600. Um, one thing I should have said uh, at the beginning of the special articles, and I forgot, I apologize, is in the past, all these articles would require a petition, except for the articles that are presented by the uh, select board. This year, in light of COVID, uh, we made the decision very early in the process, meaning the town of Middlesex made the decision that if an organization wanted to apply for the same amount of money which they requested last year, we would not require a petition, uh, just a request letter and a report which is included in the town report. So these numbers are almost all with one exception, the same amount that these organizations applied for last year. I'm sorry, I forgot to say that before we started. Um, so, Next, Article H, of the Town of Middlesex appropriate the sum of $4,050 for Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice. And I believe we have Mary Hood. I am here. Um, I'm Mary Hood and I am on the board of Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice. And um, we are asking for the same amount of money that we've asked for for the last two or three years. And we also want to thank the Middlesex Select Board for um, agreeing not to uh, require a petition because going around and trying to get people to sign their names and uh, was going to be almost impossible. And many of the time, I think a lot of the other towns in, in the state are doing the same thing. Um, 
we also have started, Center for Home Health has started to give patients who are in their, um, who are home health patients, have been able to go out starting last week, I believe, and give those patients the COVID vaccinations. And that is so helpful um, to families who have homebound relatives or even just people they take care of. Um, uh, the, I think on the page 69 of the town um, bulletin is the Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice page with their report of what they've been doing this past year. Um, we serve 23 communities in Central Vermont uh, with skilled nursing care, physical speech and occupational therapy, medication management, social work support, and personal care. Um, to, we, we care for our Central Vermonters of all ages in the comfort and privacy of their home, regardless of a person's ability to pay, their geographic remoteness or the complexity of their care needs. I think very impressive is um, the numbers for Middlesex um, for this year. Um, the home health care, we've had 942 visits, home health is in Middlesex. Hospice care, 21. Long-term care, 466. Maternal child health, 44. The total visits and contacts were 1,443. Total patients, 50. And total admissions were 59. Um, and if there's any other questions, um, if I could answer them, I'd be glad to do so. If not, I can ask um, people at Center for Vermont Home Health and get back to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your support. Question for Mary, anyone? Sorry, if anyone's in the same room as someone else who is also on this call or the same house, you're gonna have to mute yourself so we don't get that's, the feedback. That's Mary and I, that's why I keep, that's why I keep trying to mute myself. No, I'll mute myself Mary. now. Now you're both muted. There we go. Yes, sorry about that. We, uh, we are well socially separated, but not sound separated. Um, but moving on, Article 9, shall the town of Middlesex appropriate the sum of $3,000 to community connections? And Liz, you spoke for them at the last meeting, are you? Yeah, is there anyone else here who came to speak about community connections? No? Okay, going once, going twice. All right, so Community Connections is a um, program in Washington County that provides after school care for kids um, and also during like summer breaks and, and um, school vacations. Um, people use it for before care, uh, before they go to work and after um, they, uh, you know, after school, um, before they leave for work. Um, and then they use them over vacation. And it's just a, it's a great resource um, for families um, in Middlesex um, and other towns. And, um, and they've done great camps and, you know, my kids attended a number of them. I'm sure a lot of people on this call, if they had kids, their kids have also attended Community Connections and it's super, it's a super valuable asset to the community. So thank you. Any questions on community connections? Okay, Article 10. Oh, I, I had one question. I'm sorry I had to, this is Mary Hood. Um, Liz, am I correct in saying that uh, it's a sliding scale fee for parents? Um, yes. Yeah. yeah, it does um, have like the subsidies for like, if you have a daycare subsidy, those go along with this program as right. well. Right, yeah, just wanted to Thank clarify you. that. Thank yeah. you. Liz. Uh, do you know anything about how it was impacted through this year? Were they able to stay open through COVID? Did they have to shut down? What was the impact? You know, Randy, 
I, I actually have no idea um, what's gone on during COVID. I only spoke about them because there's no one else to speak about them. I don't know what's happened. I, um, does someone, Sarah, do you? Well, I work for the Montpelier Roxbury School District, which has a very similar program. Um, and I've, I've been connected with the Vermont after school community in a variety of ways, and they are open. Um, if kids are in school, then the community connections is most likely in that school. I would be very surprised if our district had done that differently. And, you know, it's, they're doing the same safety protocols the schools are doing during the day. Okay, any other questions for Liz? But Randy, oh. I can find that out. I'll just email the principal. I'm sure he'll be able to um, tell me that and I can email you to let you know. It also looks like Margaret noted in the chat, um, let me just read what she said. I'm not sure why she's not muted. Uh, community Connections is open and Vacation Camp is happening this week. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Yep. Okay, Article 10, shall the town of Middlesex appropriate the sum of 1500s to girls, boys, first mentoring and I believe Liz you also spoke to this article I think there's someone here um to speak oh, okay to I'm sorry this is here I'm sorry Fred Hi. I'm I'm Fred Skeels I'm on the uh board and stepping in for our outgoing executive director um we've been an organization for 21 years uh basically serving Montpelier and the U32 school district. Um, we actually have four mentors from Middlesex and five mentees. Uh, the matchup of mentees to mentors uh, only goes by gender, uh, not by town. So we often have um, mentors that uh, go to adjoining towns. Um, somebody from Montpelier may go to Romney or may go to uh, Middlesex. Um, our total budget is $60,000 for uh, the year. Uh, initially, we started out at 100% federal funding and we are now down to zero dollars federal funding. Um, and between the board and our executive director, um, we solicit all of our funds and municipalities and towns are on that list. We have good participation from all the towns that we serve. And uh, the majority of the funds that we solicit from municipalities go directly towards operating expenses. Um, and we greatly appreciate every single penny we get from our cities and towns. Uh, I'd be glad that the description that was in the annual report was provided by Wendy um, and is quite thorough. And I would be able to answer any random questions that you may have or get the appropriate answer and send it to you. Thank you, Fred. Any questions for Fred? Um, I have a question. Fred, are they planning on replacing like the executive director um, or making changes to the program? Because I know COVID was really, um, you guys were hit hard by COVID. Uh, yeah, we were, we got pretty inventive through, through the pandemic. Um, some of our peers uh, continue to be meet in person, but socially distanced and masked and all the appropriate stuff. Um, some of us met on social media through Zoom or actually just did regular phone calls to our mentees. And some pairs actually have ceased uh, communicating um, for a whole host of reasons, depending on living situations and stuff like that. Um, we are 
currently in the process of uh, developing uh, an advertisement to go out and recruit a new executive director. Um, that's basically the, the person that binds the board members together and keeps us all focused on the providing services. Any other uh, questions for Fred? Thank you, Fred. So, well, if you know somebody who wants to be an part-time executive director, send them our way. <laughs> Will do. Um, Article 11. Shall the town of Middlesex appropriate the sum of $29,801 to the Kellogg Hubbard Library? Uh, Sarah Seedman? Yes. I, I can speak. I, I'd also like to introduce the co-director of the Kellogg Hubbard Library, Carolyn Brennan, who's here to offer a little bit. Carol, do you want, Carolyn, do you want to start with a little data? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Carolyn, I'm one of two co-directors. The other co-director is Jesse Lynn. Uh, and we split up the administration of the library. Uh, I do anything that's library services related and Jesse does anything that is related to uh, the operations of the library as a nonprofit because we are a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, so we have seen uh, similar upheaval to other organizations this year. There have been uh, times where the building, where we haven't been able to have foot traffic in the building, where we've had a very lively um, phone and internet reference service going on, uh, and we've done curbside circulation of library materials. Uh, our total uh, physical, and physical and digital circulation uh, for the fiscal year that ended in July was 356,484 total items. Uh, we have our, our library collection now stands at about 70,000 items, give or take, uh, and it's probably going to stay there because our shelves are full. And, and uh, so as we add things, we have to also take away tired uh, and worn out things. But we also now have a digital collection uh, that's about 80,000 items, and that is um, that is streaming movies through a service called Canopy that is uh, digital magazines through a service called Flipster, uh, and then and that's also uh, downloadable ebooks and audiobooks through a service called Libby that we share with other libraries as part of a consortium called the Green Mountain Library Consortium. Uh, our our budget for this fiscal year that we're in right now is eight hundred eighty seven thousand dollars eight hundred eighty seven thousand six hundred and seventy two dollars. That's down about. Um, 5% from our budget last year. We're seeking level funding with all of our member towns this year. Uh, and so for um, Middlesex is 29,801. That pays for about 3% of our total budget. Um, and I am happy to, I love throwing out numbers. I get to do all the stats at the library. So uh, if anybody has any questions about things that we're offering or what we're doing right now, or uh, what usage is like, I'm happy to answer those questions. questions. I like having Carolyn to do that because I'm not into the, the I'll do the other side. Here's a question. Yes. Um, so I just had a question about how the, um, how it works for folks that have uh, a card with you. Um, is each family allocated a card? Is it by person within the family? Um, how does that work? If somebody was to come purchase a, a library card, what co what does that cover? Yeah, sure. Uh, so anybody that is kindergarten age or over that lives in one of our member towns, so, so Middlesex included, uh, can come in and get a library card. Uh, whether or not you get a card for every member of your family or you get one single family card is up to you. You can absolutely get a card for each person in your family. Um, I find I've got two kids at home and a husband, and uh, I find that if we keep it to one family card, it's a lot easier to keep track of everything that everybody's got out, especially the kids. So, but that's entirely a personal choice. So you can come in and get a card for everybody in your family if you want, as long as they're kindergarten age or older. 
So if you're not if you're not a member of a participating community, that yeah. family card gives everybody access, the same access at That's the same right. cost. Yep, exactly. So then uh, we charge fifty dollars for cards for people that don't live in our member communities, um, and those are those are more generally accessed as a family card. And so people get us, they buy a single one uh, and then, uh, and then the whole family uses it. That's how it typically happens. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, this is Mary Hood again. I want to thank Sarah Seidman, Seidman um, for the really great reports that she uh, has put in um, the front porch forum. And right. I, I, She's just a great representative for us in those sense. And I'm always impressed reading all the things that you do, Carolyn, um, and how you've reached out during the pandemic to uh, make sure people can access uh, your resources. Um, anyway. Well, we certainly appreciate everybody's support. And, um, and if there are other ways that we can reach out or particularly serve the residents of Middlesex, I always want to hear about it. So email me or call me at the library because we're we, we aim to meet the needs of our communities. Carolyn, I heard that some of the uh, libraries um, are loaning out snowshoes to people. Um, there are a bunch of them, but it looks like Kellogg Cupboard is not one of them. Is that correct? That is correct. We don't at this time have any sort of special collections or library of things type items. Um, and that's mainly because we serve a really wide service area and I get lots, I feel lots and lots of requests for these types of collections. And there, and we have a limited amount of space and it requires a fair amount of upkeep for some of these collections and a, and a level of expertise that goes beyond books uh, for things like cleaning and maintenance. And there's never been any one special collection like that, that I feel serves all of our towns pretty equally. And I'm not sure if snowshoes is that item. I, I'm still kind of waiting to see if there's ever a, a, a pretty strong consensus for something like that. But I've been asked to, to carry things like bear canisters for hikers, uh, power tools, gardening equipment, seeds, um, cleats for, for, for child athletes. So we get lots and lots of those requests. And you know, one of these days something's gonna click and really work for everybody and we'll carry it, but we haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, I saw that, Sarah. Um, and it's true that if you go hiking, like on the Nature Center, um, actually, uh, what's his name is here now? Chip is here now. Well, he'll talk about that. But they have um, free snowshoes that are like hooked up on the trees. So if you're doing the trails there, you can borrow the snowshoes and then you return them to the tree. It's kind of cool. Thanks, Carolyn. I just want to add one thing, which is I'm, I'm as a new trustee, I'm filling the very big shoes of people who've come before me like Mary Hood and like, like Michael. So, and also I would just like to point out that um, the other thing that the library does is offer free computer service and high-speed Wi-Fi. And I don't know about you, we are not well served by Wi-Fi on Culver Hill. And so uh, having that as a resource has been really helpful too. So thank you to everyone. Any other questions for Sarah or Carolyn? Okay, thank you both very much. Uh, moving on to Article 12, shall the town of Middlesex appropriate the sum of $7,000 to the Montpelier Senior Activity Center? And we have someone here from Montpelier? Yes. Hi, okay. I'm Jan. Yes. Hi, I'm Janet. You're down Curry. in the corner, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Hi, thank you. I serve as the director at Montpelier Senior Activity Center. I've been there for about a decade and we've been really grateful for the um, continued support of town of Middlesex voters and residents. Um, at least 70 of your residents participated in our programs and services this past year, despite COVID. Um, and like a lot of other organizations, we've pivoted a lot and been responsive um, to the community's needs um, of primarily older adults, but and increasingly we're serving younger people as well with a lot of intergenerational programming and services. Um, part of our bread and butter is our lifelong learning and healthy aging classes. Um, before the pandemic, we typically had about 75 weekly classes, um, mostly in our facility, occasionally in other towns like 
We've done classes in the town hall in Middlesex and out in the Worcester town hall and some other locations in Berlin and, and around Montpelier. So we really consider ourselves a senior center without walls. Um, and this has become especially true during the pandemic um, because we've pivoted to now have a couple dozen classes online um, on Zoom. And about half of those are in movement. Um, and most of them are available to folks who are younger. Uh, we have a few programs that are strictly for people 50 and up. We're also currently still doing our one-on-one -on -one foot care clinics in partnership with uh, Home Health and Hospice. And we've brought back this year um, with AARP help, a free tax preparation clinic um, that serves people in a low contact safe way um, in our facility. And we, we typically serve a couple hundred people with that clinic. This year, we're having to space it out differently and we're, we're still serving, um, I think about 80 people hoping to add more, um, but that's a really important service to people. Um, like the library, we have free Wi-Fi and a computer lab when we're open uh, for the public to use. We also house the Savoy's uh, former um, DVD archive, which is available to our members as well as Savoy members. Uh, and we host a lot of educational programs. Now we're doing many of those online. Um, in March, we're getting ready to host 10 um, pandemic safe online events as part of our March for Meals campaign. Encourage you to check those out on our website. Um, and some of them are family free, family friendly. Some are health and wellness related. We've got uh, a film history course with um, Rick Winston one evening. It's a really fabulous lineup. Um, I'll also mention that we're governed by 10 um, uh, advisory council members who work closely with me and our staff team. Um, and we have several vacancies coming up. We would love to have um, some nominations from folks from our supporting towns like Middlesex. So if you know someone who might be interested, um, I would be happy to provide them with more information. And it's also available on our website. So we are looking forward to eventually opening our doors back up. And in the meantime, we're um, also offering wellness calls, um, getting ready to help folks with outdoor chores in, this, in the spring um, and continuing to partner with a lot of the organizations that your residents um, sometimes volunteer with and, and receive services from. We're really grateful, as I said, for your past support and um, I'm happy to answer any questions I can um, and I'm, I'm realizing I forgot to mention that we're continuing our Meals on Wheels service, um, not to Middlesex residents, but to Montpelier in Berlin. And our curbside meals are available to folks from all towns. And I know some Middlesex residents have taken advantage of those this year. Uh, we'll look forward to bringing meals back inside when it's safe to do so. Thank you. You're welcome. Can questions. I answer any questions from anyone? Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Have a good evening. Uh, so Article 13 is the exception to our previous rule because the uh, North Branch Nature Center did not request funds from us last year. They did need to do a petition this year. So this article, they did their petition and this article is by petition, they're requesting $2,000 and we have Chip here saying, what's his name? Chip. <laughs> Hi everyone, Chip Darmstadt. I'm the executive director of the North Branch Nature Center. And uh, Susan Sussman is on this call as well. Susan is a former board member and volunteer of the Nature Center. So Susan, feel free if you have anything you wanna add. Um, it's been quite a year at the Nature Center um, and quite a year for all of us. But like many organizations, uh, we managed to pivot and continue to serve our community, including about 250 Middlesex residents, not counting people who come to uh, walk and snowshoe and ski the trails. And yes, Liz, we do offer um, snowshoes available for loan. That's what that's the what's its, his name comment. <laughs> uh, they're they're on the front porch, so you could just come by, grab a piece of. Uh, grab a pair of snowshoes and sign them out and just return them when you're done. Uh, but the trails are groomed where they're open 24 seven. Our visitor center is not open still. We've been closed to the public for uh, indoor programming since last March. 
Um, but we're looking forward to reopening at some point, hopefully this summer. But there is still a lot going on. We have a lot of online programs that uh, has been a big emphasis of ours this year. So if you go onto our website, northbranchnaturecenter.org, you'll see about three dozen online programs that you can watch for free. And there's more coming up this Friday. There's a, uh, a presentation on Vermont owls by Zach Cotto on Friday at seven, I believe it is. And just go to our website and follow the link and you can watch. Um, there's also uh, online courses for fee. Um, and there's also, there are a number of on, um, in-person programs, mostly for children. There are a few for adults right now, including a tracking series, but our after school program will be starting back up again. We just recently started a program for, for homeschoolers based on our eco program, Educating Children Outdoors. Um, our eco program has um, continued this year despite the pandemic. We are still serving about 10 different schools and we are starting with Rumney School. It's been a little slow getting off the ground this year with the pandemic, but we hope by next fall to really be up and running with that program at, at Rumney School. So we're excited about that. Uh, as I mentioned, the trails are always open. People are welcome to come out. Uh, I was working on a grant today um, for an accessible trail, a universally accessible trail. So we're fundraising and grant writing for that. So there will be a, uh, a trail that would loop around the community garden that would be accessible to all. So uh, lots going on, check out the website. Even though the pandemic has uh, changed the way we do things, in some cases, there's been silver linings like the online offerings we, we are putting out there now that we're gonna continue post pandemic. So uh, hope to see you all at an online program or on the trails and hopefully in person soon as well. Um, if there's any questions, happy to answer those. Uh, oh, one other thing I wanted to mention, sorry, I forgot. Uh, summer camp is happening this year. We've actually, it's already full. We filled it in about a week or less. <laughs> Uh, however, we did reserve at least one scholarship slot for each of the weeks, and those scholarship slots are still available. So um, we, are, we are reaching out to the community, including Capstone, to uh, identify folks who might benefit from a, a scholarship for summer camp at the North Branch Nature Center. So if you want more information about that, um, uh, give me a shout, uh, chip at northbranchnaturecenter.org, or give me a call. Uh, so yeah, any questions or Susan, did you want to add anything? No, just Chip, do you want to say anything about the construction that's happening now? Yeah, uh, thank you for that reminder. Uh, so I don't know if, if folks have driven by and have noticed that the farmhouse is looking quite different. We got a grant to weatherize the farmhouse. So that 1850s farmhouse, which has been a very leaky uh, energy suck is now properly weatherized. We're hoping to be a net zero campus when all is done. So we're doing some interior renovations to uh, the farmhouse as well. Um, so it's uh, a major facelift and a major energy upgrade for the nature center. And we look forward to people being able to see that uh, when we're uh, reopened to the public. Thank you, uh, Susan and Chet. Any questions for either of them? Okay, thank you. Thanks all uh, for your support. Article 14, shall the town of Middlesex appropriate the sum of $10,000 to support the Waterbury Senior Center Meals on Wheels program? And we have Justin and his cat here ready to talk thank about that. Thank you. The cat Hi, Justin. The cat is being quiet for a moment, so I'm good to talk. So uh, I am the chairperson at the Waterbury Senior Center. Um, I wanted to report a few numbers for you, uh, especially about our Meals on Wheels program, which is the part relevant to you guys. Um, at the moment, we have eight Middlesex residents who are currently receiving Meals on Wheels and most of those get seven, uh, seven meals each week. Uh, we deliver five days a week, and that means that approximately 260 times each year, one of our drivers will knock on the door, 
deliver the meals. And what I think is most important, they will uh, have a brief, short uh, a wellness visit, we call them with our recipients. Uh, a chance to say, uh, say hello, see how things are going. Um, those difficult tasks in the day, opening a jar or helping reach something um, that is so important. And that is going on approximately 260 times uh, each year uh, for each person. That means uh, approximately 2,500 meals uh, delivered uh, in your area um, uh, in a year. And uh, funding is especially difficult at the moment. Um, we are not able to use the Waterbury Centre's own space for congregate meals uh, or to rent out to have any income that way. So we are especially thankful for the support of the towns who we, who we serve. Um, and we are requesting $10,000, which is the same as last year, and every penny will be very, very well spent. Any questions? Thank you, Justin. Take good care of that cat. I will, thank you. <laughs> okay, good evening. Uh, so next is Article 14, Article 4, excuse me, Article 15. Article 15 is our, I call it the omnibus article. It's all the organizations who request $250 or less. And there's quite a laundry list of them. Um, they're, in their they're in the town report and there is also a little uh, report from each one of them describing what they do. Uh, the way this article works is you vote either or will vote either for for all or none. There are no picking and choosing. So the amount of the article, the total is $5,017. If you vote for that article, all those organizations get that uh, amount of money that they requested. Um, I really can't speak in particular for any of those. The reports are in the town report. You can, you can read them. If you have any particular questions or concerns, you can contact myself or any other member of the uh, select board. But there's no, uh, there's no changing those requests and there's no adding or removing anybody from that list. Um, so with that, if there are no questions on that, I'm gonna move on to article 16, which is a petitioned article and it reads, shall the town voters authorize that all special articles requesting town taxpayer funding, except the annual municipal budget be voted on by Australian ballots starting on March 1st, 2022. So that would be next year's town meeting. So right now we're voting by Australian ballot on the basis of a one year exception. If this article passes, um, we will be voting on all these special articles in the future uh, by Australian ballot the same way we are uh, this year. And is there anyone Except who would like to? Well, budget. Excuse me, Mary. Except our municipal budget. I said special articles, yes. Oh, the municipal sorry. budget will be considered a town meeting, yes. Quiet group. Well, that will, unless anybody has uh, any other questions or concerns about any of these uh, articles, that will conclude our informational meeting. I would like to ask the select board to stay on just for a quick uh, minute after we adjourn the informational meeting. Thanks all. Yes. Just thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, everybody. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Select board members, please stay on. Thanks for coming, everybody. Yep. Bye, Mary. Um, Peter, I made Sarah the host. So if she's going to stay on for the select board meeting, that's all good. But if not, yep, Sarah, you'll have good. to make someone else the host. 
Nope, Sarah, um, that's fine. Thank you. Sarah, okay. Sarah, stay on. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you, Sarah. Bye, Sarah. Oh. Peter, do you want me? Sure. You, you bet. Want me? Uh, <laughs> I don't think we need you, Vic, but you're certainly welcome. Wow. Are we allowed to have a meeting? You're this not allowed to have. It's not a meeting. This is a meeting. You. No, I don't think we wow. can have a meeting. You cannot take any action at this. No, meeting. we can't take any action. Can we discuss anything? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It, it is. It is uh, noticed, and it was yeah. Yeah, it's a meeting. So, what, so I just have I just have two really quick things. The meeting. Um, one thing is the the question came up uh, after after our last board meeting about doing a background check on our new uh, financial person. And uh, I know Dorinda has feelings about this. I don't believe myself personally in uh, reference checks because nobody gives, nobody gives anybody a bad reference. Or in my experience, 45 years of experience, nobody gives anybody a bad reference. But uh, a, background, a background check is a different issue. Uh, Dorinda pointed out to me that what I already knew is that this person has um, no ability to move money, sign checks, get money, access to money. They can look at they can look at numbers, but they can't uh, they can't uh, they can't get at any money. There's no way. Um, so I just want to, before we go any further with that, I was curious if anybody else had any thoughts of this. I did ask uh, Liz to find out who um, Capstone uses to do their background checks. Um, and I know there, you can go online and there are all kinds of organizations that offer background checks for $50 or less. I don't know which ones are the good ones or the bad ones. I would use if we decide to do it. Um, I would use uh, I would use the one that uh, uh, Capstone uses, and I would do it on do it on my authority. So we don't need a motion, or we don't need to take action. But if anybody has anything to say about that, uh, now is the time. Uh, I'm confused. Are you thinking that you want to do it or that you don't want to do it? You and Dorinda. Well, it's been, it's, it, there's, there's been concern expressed that we did not do it. My feeling is I am comfortable. I am comfortable not doing it. Uh, Dorinda, you might want to speak up. Well, um, I, I agree with you. First of all, nobody's going to give you personal references that are going to condemn any, you know, them at all. So, um, and uh, his resume resonates where he's been working with um, a lot of different, um, in a lot of different places, um, not physically working, but volunteering and other activities and interests. I did certainly, you know, Google his name and um, did as much research as I could that way. If there's a concern about um, any kind of sexual predator or anything like that, that's free access to the website. Um, but my thing, as I told Peter, is I don't see how he could, you know, walk away with any money. He's not the treasurer. He, he doesn't have that role at all. And um, he's only got eyes on everything. Well. I will make the point that as someone who hires people, first of all, references should have been just, that's just commonplace with anyone. I don't care if they're giving you references that are gonna be good references. If you know how to ask the questions, you can usually get what you the information that you need. And if it turned out he was a terrible employee, then we could say, well, we checked his references, right? If we do nothing, I, I, I cannot stand by and allow us to not even do reference checks or a background check on someone who's going to be a bookkeeper for us. I'm sorry, I just cannot. And the fact that it was made public on an ORCA meet, a, 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 on a t television, and it was sort of flippantly, you know, just regarded as like, well, Liz, uh, you can say, I told you so. I, that 
to me is just to need to do something. We either need to do reference checks or we need to do a background check. And I'm happy to do the reference checks. He's not, he, he's not gonna be mad if I call him up and say, hey, we missed a part. Do you mind if we just do some reference checks? He'll give us names. I'll do the, I'll do the other check too. I'm, I'm not saying he would, but first let me say something that I've been done a lot of hiring myself for over many years. And I mean, you didn't attend the meeting, you didn't have the interview with the gentleman. Okay, so that's one thing. Secondly, nobody was being flippant about it. The select board, all except for you were there and nobody at the time suggested this. And we- I may would say that's because we don't do this. We're, we're never hiring people. That's not our, we, we normally aren't hiring people for, for positions. It's normally like Steve hiring someone for the road or something. Well, but we did hire our last bookkeeper with no background check and the one prior to that with no background check. So I just think don't it's say we don't put people in this position. I'm not here to argue it. I'm just saying that we're kind of putting, we've offered the gentleman the job and now we're putting the tail before the dog. So it's not too late to do it. That's all I'm saying. And I think that it's well, just prudent for us to, if anything were to go, I mean, you read about this in the papers and on TV that somehow someone has, and I'm not, I don't think this guy's going to, I have no worries that this guy looked at his resume. He looks great. You can't find him on the internet. I don't have any worries about that, but I just feel like as a town that we are, you know, it, it's our due diligence to do very simple things that everyone does when they hire someone. I mean, I, I checked Steve's son's references. I didn't say, oh, it's Steve's son. I'm sure he's fine. You know, I, so I just, I, I'm standing firm on that. Well, I mean, I think you have a bigger concern when somebody's elected to a position like a treasurer and there's no opportunity to do any background check. That's a bigger position problem. So, we can't take any formal action. We can't have a uh, uh, we can't have a motion, and I don't think we should wait until our next meeting. So I guess I am I am happy on my own authority to call him up and ask him for a couple of references. And Liz, you can check them. How about that? Is everybody okay with that? I'm fine with that. And what about what about doing a formal background check? I am not in favor of doing that. No, I don't think we need to. That will make you. We have to uh, do something. That's okay. That'll that's make you happy. Well, Dorinda yes. and I did. I spent I spent about an hour and a half searching around uh, on the internet. I have to believe if there was anything really bad out there, it would have popped up, or Dorinda or I would have found it. But anyway, um, I don't mind. I don't mind calling him and asking him. Uh, and if he gives me a hard time about it, we'll figure out what we do. I don't think he will. Um, I'll be nice. I'll be nice. Um, so, so that's item number one. Quick item number two is, uh, as you know, Delia, uh, Delia volunteered her, her services to our town and she's not a resident of our town. She's not an official of our town. She's uh, Susan Clark's sister, which is a very important role, but um, she provided a lot of value. She participated in a couple, of, a couple of meetings. She spent the entire time at our last informational meeting and I think made a substantial contribution to this, uh, to this process of these informational meetings. And then uh, Sarah Berger, who is a town resident, also, uh, also contributed uh, quite a bit. Um, I, I thought we should maybe do something for Susan Clark too, but Sarah pointed out to me that she's the moderator and that's her job, so we shouldn't do anything for her. <laughs> so she gets crossed off the list. So the question then came up, came up what to do. And um, um, I asked, uh, I asked uh, Susan to come up with something for her sister. And she came up with, um, who was it, Sarah? Simon Pierce. Yeah, a dinner at Simon Pierce, which would be not that we have to pay the entire cost of the dinner, but a gift certificate at Simon Pierce. Um, That's great. 
Sarah with her with her with her eye on the prize uh, suggested that that seemed that seemed over the top to her and maybe we should give gift certificates to businesses in town. Um, well, that would work for uh, for Sarah Berger, but it's not going to work very well for Delia because she lives in Woodstock. Um, so I was I was fine doing a seventy five or eighty dollar gift certificate to Simon Pearson and whatever, but I, I don't just want to do that. And uh, I don't want to disrespect uh, Sarah's, Sarah's opinion that it's too much. So I don't know how you guys feel. Well, what are you suggesting Sarah Berger? Yes. Same thing for Sarah Berger? I don't know, Mary. I I would say so. Yes. I mean, I would say she did. She put in as much time as no, Delia did, or maybe not. Simon Pierce, a Simon Pierce gift certificate for Sarah Berger. No, no, no. A, a different restaurant. Oh, I mean, okay. we could we could do a Red Hen gift certificate yeah. for Sarah Berger. I the amount. I just was wondering why you'd want to give Sarah one. She'd have to travel no, down. No, 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 no. Yeah, I think Delia. Maybe. I don't know, guys. I, I just think, you know, we, we said we would at the beginning of this process that we were willing to pay somebody. Her normal fee would have been to do these two meetings would have been about $800. I, I, I think yeah. we should do So I, I would go with 100 though, for, um, for Delia. Somehow 80 seems like not quite Eight. enough for two people. Yeah, I'm it's curious. either 75 or 100. 80 is like a number. <laughs> Simon Pierce isn't cheap. No. <laughs> no, it's not. It's nice though. It is nice. Well, I just I think she she really provide and she's, you know, she's volunteered and done stuff for our town before too. So it's just it's a thank you. It's not a real a real measure of uh, the amount of effort she put in. But okay. And and would we do this do the same for uh, Sarah Briget, do it for Red Hen? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hey, you want a hundred dollars for Red Hen and a hundred dollars for Simon Pierce? Yes. Okay. okay. Sarah, can you spend a hundred dollars at Red Hen? Yeah, I was gonna say, what about the burger joint, the new burger joint in town? The fill-in station? Yeah, do they have gifts gift cards? They're opening on Friday at eleven AM. Oh, you can be the first in line, Sarah, to get the gift card. <laughs> no, don't. That's not what I'll be doing on Friday. <laughs> Monday. <laughs> he doesn't work on that day, remember? Oh, that's right. <laughs> right. Uh, she doesn't work, work for us on that day. Well, I don't, I don't care whether it's the Red Hen or the, I mean, it might be fun to do the filling station. I don't know. I don't know anything about them. She might not be able to spend a hundred dollars there. I don't oh, know. Yeah. I think they it's serve alcohol, alcohol Mary. You could spend a hundred dollars. You could spend a hundred there, yeah. You could have two visits. Right. What about Roots? Oh, that's a good idea. Well, that's another one. Yeah, I bet she'd love that. You could easily spend a hundred dollars at Roots. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, mean, you can they buy sell... six years. You can buy six years of corn for a hundred dollars at Roots. <laughs> well, they sell. <laughs> they have wine and beer. Yeah. They have all of that. So it's a great idea. No, I think that's. I think that's a great idea. Actually. Yeah, I think Roots is much better. Yeah, me too. Okay, okay. so do Simon Pierce for Delia and Roots for uh, Sarah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I'm not going to put this in the minutes, okay? Because I don't want to ruin the surprise. Right. There you go. No, don't put it in the minutes. On Orca, if somebody wants. Orca's recording it. It doesn't matter. No, <laughs> I'm sure Delia is watching right now. <laughs> no, maybe. I don't. I don't care. I, I want to say. I want to say thank you. She really. Uh, she really stepped up for us. So I think we should. We don't have a meeting next week, right? Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. So. Oh. March second is the your normal meeting. Yeah, but, but you're ballots and stuff. We don't no, want to. No, 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 no. Uh, uh. I'm no. not doing three freaking meetings in March. I am meeting out. Okay. Me too. So, uh, if I, I'm gonna have to like just skip a meeting because I'm just gonna my head's gonna explode. So there's. Why don't we just have the meeting next on on the on March second? You can sign orders. It'll be really quick and dirty. Then the next meeting will be the. Or Six will be the sixteenth. That's the organizational meeting, and then you'll be done until April. Doesn't that sound nice? Yes. Yes. 
So five to five thirty. So what we're saying is we're not we're not going to have a real meeting on the second. We're just going to sign orders. Well, we're going to have a meeting like this. We're going to chime in if there's like a, a, a driveway permit that needs to be signed or, you know, orders. You get all that kind of housekeeping done. And then we'll just say bye bye. It's not like we're going to have anybody, you know, testify so a or quick, a quick five o'clock, a quick five o'clock. Yeah. Meeting. And then the 16th will be the organizational meeting. But look at you guys have been meeting. We've all been meeting, 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 meeting. I mean, this is going to, this will be great. You'll be so happy by April. So is there anything that needs to be done? Can we de delay the organizational meeting till the next meeting? Well, it's between the, the second and the, tw and the 16th, I guess, uh, you know, you'll just turn in your oaths and, uh, and then I think we can, I think we can exist for, for that time, period of time without. You'll have to give me permission to pay bills. Yeah. Okay. We can do that at that next meeting. Yeah. You're saying no meeting on the 16th? No, I'm Either. saying a meeting. No, 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 no. That would be the organizational meeting. Oh, okay. All right. Why would Lynn, why would Dorinda have permission to pay bills? Well, I mean, next week is our um, check run. Like this week was payroll. Next week is checks we have to sign. So that's the yeah, second. If we, do, if we do orders, isn't that the permission? Well, I mean, I can send that out. You'll have to give me, you'll have to do that without, can you do it without a warned meeting? No, we're going to have saying. a meeting on the second. We're going to have a meeting. Oh, you're going to have it on. That's, I thought why, you said. that's the only reason to have a meeting on the second, just so we can do that. Okay. And then you'll, and then we'll and have this one on the 16th. Yeah. It's just, we'll just stick to the normal schedule. Okay. All right. Yeah. As long as you're doing the orders on the second, so, I didn't get that. So we might have new select board members. So oh. it's new select board meter members that meet on the second. No, because they won't have been elected yet. No, nope. that's correct. Right. It'll be, it'll right. be okay. It'll be All right. Okay. okay. Got it. Yep. Okay. Can I ask a question? Done. Yes. Wait. What? What were you going to say, Phil? I just said, "Are we done?" Oh, <laughs> I just had a question. Six, six, um, two. Thank you, Steve. Okay. <laughs> um so just quickly and, and i guess i we i can ask everybody here um at the capital spending plan meeting um there's a, sort of our first task is um the central vermont regional planning commission talking to the select board about um the parameters around what gets included in a capital spending plan so like you know the cost of something, the size of it, like what, you know, is it trucks, is it buildings, is it whatever it is. Um, is that something that you think we need to have as a, like she would need to come to a meeting that is one of our regularly warned meetings? Because that would be probably the meeting right after our informational or our organizational meeting. Um, or is it like something that she could sit down with like Peter and me to talk about? Um, I think the, I think the board should make the decision about what's going to be included and excluded okay. and the size, but I don't think she needs to be there. I think she can. Well, I think she'll, she'd be there to help guide, to, to frame what it is that we're talking about. Like, I think that should, that is part of what she wants that, that she will meet with us on. Well, then she, then she should, okay. then she should be there, but I think it's important for us to make those okay. decisions. All right. that's so really I will tell her to, that, um, and Sarah, I'll be in touch with you about, I think it would be the following meeting because the deadline, because this, we're pushing everything back a little bit so that we have it for town meeting potentially to sign a year from now. So everything has to move a little bit faster. Um, so. Well, we could do it on the second part on the 16th, yeah. couldn't we? Organizational yeah. take like 10 minutes. Okay. Well, yeah, do we, do we usually hold just an organizational meeting and then we get down to the uh, regular meeting. I want, to, uh, before we go, I would like everybody to kind of think of a couple of things. One, we have not in my tenure ever appointed a tree warden. And somehow during re investigating all this stuff we had to do for what needs to be on the ballot, it came to our attention that that is an absolute necessity. You absolutely have to have a tree warden, which will solve some of the problems like what Lisa Parrish was saying, you know? So well, I, let's hmm? ask the 
Conservation Commission to help us find a person. Fine, but that, I mean, just that someone to just get get in the when you're thinking about appointing people. The other thing is that it's very unlikely we're going to get enough write-ins for the lister position, and we need a third lister. Having two listers is just a disaster. So um, if you can possibly think or uh, come up with some names of people who might be willing to uh, serve as lister for at least a year before they run again. Those are Lister, ZBA, Tree Warden. Well, you, ZBA, is that the one Phil just stepped down from? Yep. Yeah. Oh, that, that's a toughie. <laughs> it is a toughie. <laughs> so what, be, what does do the tree part. warden do? Well, the tree warden does, if the town needs to take down a tree, the tree warden goes out there and says, to, you know, deals with the landowner and the and the and the, and the the road crew or whoever you hire to take down the tree to talk about taking down trees. If you say we want to clear some trees on Center Road to improve our sight lines, whoever's property that the town's right of way runs into where those trees are, they need to be consulted with the tree warden. That's what the tree warden does. And it's a weird. It's like we've been we've been having you know jur you know grand jurors and you know whatever for years this is actually something we've actually had to have well it sounds know, like a road commissioner job sarah yeah well it does and that's where you get into problems now you can you can just get the tree warden to work with the homeowner so that people don't get mad trees are controversial like roads are controversial back when i was on the select board peter weren't we wasn't all the select board members they were the fence viewers the tree wardens <laughs> yeah. and everything there we were all those well, I was the fence viewer for about 15 yeah. years, I think. I never viewed one fence. Yeah, that, that's basically what we did in the past. So. I, I want that job. <laughs> well, it, it's been abolished, Phil. <laughs> ben, what was your question? It, um, like you, Sarah, what you're telling us is by statute, we need to have one, by right? Statute. Have one. It's by yeah, statute. It's by statute. Like one of those right. things I stumbled upon and, and you know, Lisa Parrish raises a when she calls up and says, who did that with the trees? You know, if that were on her property, she could say, where was the tree warden in this? That's a perfect example. Well, and I she, think you don't, you don't want the road commissioner to be the tree warden also. I don't know, maybe. No, we didn't say that. I didn't say that. No one said, uh, there's nothing that says you can't be the tree warden. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> there's nothing that says you can't be the tree warden. Oh, well. I would, I would say, over the years, most of the tree problems that I'm aware of have all been, you know, town, town right of way, but private landowners' land issues. That is exactly right. You that know, is very you know right. nobody's nobody's worried about the big ash tree that has bugs in it that's in somebody's back forty acres. Right. So, Peter, yeah, just think of our neighbor um, Liz and how angry she was when her trees were cut back. Oh, she's not alone. Mary. Yeah, Mary permanently has her hand up. <laughs> Mary, <laughs> no, you permanently have your hand up. You have I a do. Probably. I do not. Hey guys, uh, I'm willing to say I think we've all had enough for tonight. I do. Peter, Peter, Peter. Vic, Vic, Vic's got the last word. Yes, Vic. Okay, so you got um. Next week, uh, I'm back in the same situation I was a few weeks ago. I got a dentist appointment, but I should be out by five. Okay. But I don't think it's mandatory that I be there anyways, unless you- I don't think there'll be much. No. no. A minute meeting. Yeah. I think Steve could fill in for me. He's very, he's very experienced. <laughs> I think we I'll can. I think we here. can. I think we can handle it in your absence, Victor. If something comes well, up. Oh, oh, Why? You got two of you. We could have Shane. <laughs> Shane did a great job of shoveling the front steps. I, that was a monumental task, and he did it right away. And they're fantastic. It was just like that. I asked him once. It was done. There you go. Good. And he right. responded very quickly to my email around it was we couldn't see over the hills anymore at the bottom of Culver Hill Road and almost got smashed into again. And he was like, I'll clear them. So that's great. Yeah, it's really yeah. nice. Oh, things are, things are looking good. Okay, guys. Okay, Bye. guys. Bye. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm done. I'm adjourning the meeting. Thank you all Bye. very much. Bye.